Good morning, good morning, good morning. I greet you in the mighty, wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, look, I want to tell you that uh, he is still the Lord of my life. He's still the Savior of my life. And uh, he, he can also become your Savior. He can also become the Lord of your life. Um, he is the resurrected one and he's now seated in the heavenly places on the right, cent right side of God and is interceding for me and, and, and you. So, so, so on that note, uh, before I, I, I continue with um, how to deal with fornication, I want to briefly share with you um, uh, the dream uh, that, that I had on the 3rd of May. Uh, in the early hours of the morning, um, in this dream, there was one of the one, one man of God that we know in the country uh, that had invited another man of God. Uh, in the, uh, uh, again, I know the men, the two men of God, and we 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 were all going to uh, this place to pray. Uh, and I could see people were gathering, people were gathering, people were gathering, people were gathering. And what I remember very well in that dream is as we were going uh, for, 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 for prayer uh, um, uh, with this other man of God invited to lead prayer. Uh, as we were going there, we were passing uh, a, a, a number of places where people were partying. I remember very well, people were partying and, also, um, and some of us were walking uh, towards that land. It was a huge land where, where people were being gathered for the purpose of prayer. And, and as we were gathering in the, uh, at that place for prayer, of course other people kept partying and, and, and we, we went ahead to, to pray. And as we continued to pray, the, the man of God who was the host, uh, uh, took us to another place. Um, he was leading us to another place. And as we were in that place, he was showing us, he was pointing us to people. And, 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 and uh, 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 it's an it's a, it's a informal settlement type of a place. And he was saying to us, it, it was not far from where we had gathered to pray. And this man of God was saying, you see these people in this place, they've been staying here for long and next to the church. Uh, Sunday in, Sunday out, we preach the message and they continue to reject the message. They refuse this message because if, if they had accepted this message, they would have changed their ways of life. And he said, maybe we must continue to, to, to you know, in, in fact, he said, we must focus on people like this. Immediately, immediately when he said we must focus uh, 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 at people like this and, and places like this, we were taken to another place, again, not very far from where we'd gathered to pray. And when we're in that place and people continued to pray, my eyes opened up. And as my eyes opened up, I saw the Lord standing. And he said, he was looking down and he said, Tabo, the Lord is ready to return. See, he is even standing. The Lord is ready to come back. The Lord is ready for his second coming. And he said, look, he is even standing. So, so to, to, to emphasize the, 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 the importance and, and to emphasize the urgency of his coming, he was even standing up. He was not seated. He was standing and said, he is standing. He is ready to come back. I want to let you know that Jesus is coming back. I know we've been talking about it. Even people before us have been talking about the second coming of Jesus. And I want to add to those people. And I want to tell you, I want to tell me that Jesus is coming back. He is ready to come back. There is nothing that is holding him back from coming. He is coming. He is even ready, more ready to come back for his church, to come back for the bride. And, and I want to look you, I want you to look at these details to say other people were, were there. They were their lives were as normal. They were continuing with their lives as normal. And while others were gathering, it's, it's like the Lord was gathering his harvest. It was like, it's like the Lord was bringing his church together in preparation for the coming of his son. And, and I believe this is what is happening. I, we, we are getting more closer and closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus. You may not believe it. I will not force you to believe it. But I'm telling you the truth that Jesus is coming back. The Bible says it. Other servants of the Lord have said it, are saying it, and I'm also adding and I'm saying it that Jesus is coming back. He is even more ready to come back. He's standing to come back. He's not seated. He's, he's ready. He's ready. Any moment he can come. Any moment he can come. Even if it takes 10 years, any moment Jesus is going to come for his church. And, and I want you to look at this, that some people will think that maybe everyone must hear the word of God and everyone must be born again before Jesus comes back. And let me tell you, the people's unrepentant heart is not going to stop him from coming back. 
It's not going to stop him from coming back. He's not. He's not going to be stopped by, 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 because I mean, in that, in that place, there were people that have been hearing the word of God. That's why it says Sunday in, Sunday out, we have been preaching in this place. People hear this word, but they reject it. And there it says, look, the Lord is ready. He's even standing to come back. I miss those people who are rejecting his word, refusing to repent. So those people will not stop him from coming back. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to let you know, I want to encourage you to say, if you are born again, hold on. Don't play. Don't play with this thing. Don't play with this thing. Don't play with salvation. Don't play. You might have been playing before, but this is not the moment to play. Please, this is not the moment to play. It's not the moment to play. And besides Jesus coming back, just imagine you play and you die while you are playing. Where will you go? If Jesus comes back today, would you look at him with joy or would you, look, would you look at him with embarrassment and shame that you have not walked right with him? Yes, I know possibly yesterday you were not walking right, but today you've got an opportunity to walk right and to fix your life with God. Jesus is coming back. He's even more ready to come back. Us playing church is not going to stop him from coming back. Us being unfaithful is not going to stop him from coming back. There is nothing. Our plans, the plans we have for ourselves, the plans we have for our children, the plans we have for the ministries that we lead is not going to stop Jesus from coming back. He's not, in fact, he's not into our plans. We must be in his plans. Some of us think that because we still have to raise our kids, we still have to be millionaires or we still have to uh, have a church of 5,000. We think Jesus is going to wait for that. He's not going to wait for that. Any moment he decides to say, now I'm going, and the father say, go, he's going to go, irrespective of our plans. Don't measure the coming of Jesus Christ based on the plans you and me have. We must measure his return based on his word. Any moment Jesus can come back. Any moment Jesus can come back. So this is the dream that I had. This is the dream that I had. Every time I, 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 I meditate on this dream, tears just come in my life because I'm saying, is the church ready? Are the children of God ready? Are the people who profess faith ready for his coming? To some possibly he will really appear like a thief, but to others he will not come like a thief. He will come like a thief to those who are not expecting him. But to us that are expecting him, he's not going to come as a thief. He's not going to come as a thief. May the Lord not come to you as a thief, but may he come to you as the Lord. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, I pray that you'll open our eyes so that we can see the truth of your word. That indeed Jesus is coming back and will stop playing. And we will live right, Lord, as you have called us to live right, as you have called us to be saints. I am praying for this revival, Lord, to continue and to spread across the world, to spread across the country, to spread across provinces and, 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 and affect all of us so that we, Lord, will always be ready for your second coming and you will not come to us like a thief. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray you can say amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let the church say, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. Be ready for his second coming. He is ready. He is ready to come back. But the question is, are you ready for his coming? Are you ready for his return? Indeed, Jesus is coming back. So let us continue today on the subject of how to deal with fornication. And I will, I will be wrapping up on this topic, how to deal with fornication. So I have done uh, the first part last week, Sunday, and I'm going to continue with this last part today. And I want to thank everyone that has been watching this message and sharing it with other people. I, I understand that it may not be a message that we want to hear. It may not be the message uh, that excites us, that tickles us, and that, that, that that, that, that requires high five, but this is a message that requires introspection. This is a message that calls us, even as we prepare for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, it calls for us as a church to repent and live right and, and, and make right uh, uh, with, with God so that when Jesus indeed comes, we will not look at him with shame, we will not look at him with guilt, we will not look at him with an embarrassment. And as we continue on how to deal with fornication, let's look at, at at, at first, first Corinthians chapter 5 verse 2. First Corinthians chap, chapter 5 verse 2. 
And this is when uh, uh, Paul says, uh, Apostle Paul writes and say, look, I've had this is what is happening in, 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 in your church or in, in, in your fellowship. And then Paul continues to say, I mean, this person, some of you are even proud of these things. And, and he says, this person should in fact not be part of you, not be part of you. So I'm saying here that believers practicing fornication should be removed from the fellowship. I know we don't do this. We, we don't do this. We, we are reluctant to do this. We, we are not comfortable to do this because the world has, has, has taught us and, and the world continues to dictate to us how we must approach the things of God instead of us uh, informing the world and showing the world how to approach the whole creation of God. So we no longer remove people from our fellowship. It does not matter how wicked I am or how sinful I am. You will not remove me from your fellowship. That's why and I said, remember previously, I said the sin of fornication is contagious. The sin of fornication, it moves from one person to another. So when you don't remove people who practice fornication, who practice fornication, you will end up leading a church of fornicators. The fact that people are not, are, not, are not pregnant, the fact that people are not having children does not mean they're not fornicating. It's simply that, that they've researched and they know all the contraceptives and they know preventative measures, but that does not talk to purity. But of course, there are those that are living pure lives and, 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 and they are fleeing sexual immorality. So in this case, as believers practicing fornication should be removed from the fellowship. So the word practice is not a once-off thing. The word practice is not an event. So, so it's, it's a... It's, it's a continuous thing. It's a continuous thing. So today you do it. Tomorrow you do it. Next week you do it. People talk to you. People try to correct you. The Lord tries to correct you through people. But you, could, you do not stop. And you continue to live in fornication. Such a person is practicing fornication. I want you to understand. Such a person is practicing fornication. And, and remember, when we talk of the word practice, a word practice, what, what, the, the, the things that quickly come to my mind when I talk practice is that uh, you, you, you purpose to practice. Uh, uh, when you talk of practice, you, you, you become intentional of what you're going to do. You plan to say, this is what I'm going to do. You plan even the, the consequences to say, this is what I want to achieve when I practice. So you don't just wake up and say, I'm going to practice without a plan, without an objective, without a purpose, without a plan. So this person who practices fornication, it means this person is deliberately sinning. And the Bible says concerning such a person, the person must be removed from your fellowship. Sexual people who are practicing sexual immorality, they must be removed from the fellowship of the saints because the fellowship of the saints is not a social gathering. It's the coming together of the people who belong to God. And people who belong to God do not make a habit of continuously sinning even after receiving grace. So it says remove the person from your fellowship. How many of us are prepared to remove people from our fellowship? How many of us are prepared to remove ourselves from the fellowship of the saints? Because we are deliberately living in sin. We are deliberate, we are purposefully living in sin. So Paul says remove such a person from the fellowship of the saints. And we continue, we look at Ezekiel chapter 23, verse, verse, verse 48. Ezekiel 23, verse 8, it reads as follows. So I will put an end to indecency in the land, and all the women will be admonished not to imitate your behavior. All the women will be admonished not to imitate your behavior. So believers should be admonished not to imitate a person who fornicate. Remember last week we spoke about not partaking or participating in fornication. So here we are saying you must be admonished not to imitate a person who fornicate. But unfortunately, most of us as believers, we learn through imitation. If someone fornicates, becomes pregnant, we fornicate and but do it in a modern way and prevent so that we do not become pregnant. But we are imitating. We are imitating wrong things instead of imitating right. We are imitating wickedness instead of imitating righteousness. It says, I will, so, 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 listen, all women will be admonished not to imitate your behavior. But then we have a call, Berathans, we have a call not to imitate people who are living in sexual immorality. We have a call not to imitate people who are fornicators, people who are prostitutes. We have a call not to imitate them, but instead to live right. I, I, I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you wherever you are and listening to me, that if indeed you are living in fornication, please 
Don't imitate. Don't imitate. And others who are not living in, 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 in fornication, don't imitate those that are living in fornication. Don't. So here it says, let us not imitate those who live in sexual immorality. And as we move on, we look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 7. It says, therefore do not be partakers with them. Do not be partakers with them. So I've written down here that make a decision not to cooperate or to co-participate in fornication. Make a decision not to co-participate in fornication. If a brother comes to you, if a sister comes to you and, and, and desires to sleep with you, you have a duty not to participate in that. You have a duty to refuse. You have a duty to say no without feeling guilty. And this is where most of us are feeling. The reason why most of us go back to fornicate is because we say no and feel guilty about saying no. We say no to wrong things and feel bad about our no's and go back and do the wrong thing. You must be able to say no without feeling guilty. So let us, it says, therefore do not be partakers with them. And, 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 and we say, we each have an opportunity to make choices daily. We each have an opportunity to make choices daily. And, and we have an opportunity to participate or not participate. We have opportunity to participate in fornication or not participate. That is our choice. That is our choice. And, and it says, and it's, it's, it's about choices and not feelings. It's about choices and not feelings. Look, we, we all have sexual desires. Believers have got sexual desires. Non-believers have got sexual desires. It's not about feelings. It's about choices. Because at times we do not choose how we feel. But we have an absolute choice on what we do with how we feel. Let me repeat it. At times we do not have a choice on how we feel. But we have an absolute choice on what we do with how we feel. So believers, you've got a choice over what you do with how you feel and our feelings themselves. And I'm saying here that the choice is yours today. The choice is yours today. Whether you're going to participate in fornication or not, it's yours. Whether you're going to continue with sexual immorality or not, the choice is yours. The choice is yours. You cannot choose. You can choose to repent and walk with God again. You can choose to stop and wait for marriage. Even if marriage does not come, the choice is yours. At the end, the choice is yours. It's you who will stand before God and give an account of what you have done. So the choice is yours today. And, 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 and look, you, you, you do not live pure life because you wait for the day of marriage. You live a pure life because that's what pleases God. That's what attracts the presence of God in our lives. Even if you do not get married or even if your marriage de delays, you still have and a duty or an obligation to live a pure life and to flee sexual immorality in the name of Jesus. So it says, therefore do not be partakers with them. Do not be partakers with them. And we continue, we look at Numbers 25 verse 5. Numbers 25 verse 5. Liba, bro, I want to I want to pray right now. I pray, I pray for a person that is, is watching this and saying, hey, Pastor Tabo, I, I want to leave fornication, but I'm afraid how I'm gonna feel. I'm I'm breaking that spirit of fear out of your life. Fear has no hold over you, and fear does not come from God. Just make a choice today to live free from fornication, and God is going to empower you. God has already empowered you, it's in your power, it's in your choice. In Jesus' name. And when we look at Numbers 25 verse 5. Numbers 25 verse 5 it says, So Moses told the judges of Israel, Each of you, each of you must kill all of his men who have joined in worshipping a Baal of Pure. You will remember that after, after they, 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 they slept uh, with, 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 with the ladies there, they ended up worshipping their God. So I've written here that the church must be able to confront fornication instead of wishing it away. The church must be able to confront fornication instead of wishing it away. You know, there are times sometimes, and we, we love burying our heads in the sand and as, as believers. I'm not only talking pastors or, or apostles or teachers or evangelists or prophets. I'm talking about all of us as saints. We love burying uh, our heads in the sand. Instead of addressing and confronting issues in our personal lives and in the lives of others, we rather bury our heads in the sand and hope these things, when we take our heads out of the sand, they'll have resolved themselves. They will not resolve themselves until we become bold and humble enough and loving enough to address and confront such things. What, what, what however, we observe is that when we lose the zeal of God, 
When we lose the zeal for God, when we lose the zeal for God, we also lose any sense of righteousness. Hands hardly confront any sin in the church, let alone a, a, a sin in our lives. When we lose the zeal of God, we lose the sense of righteousness. That's why we can't confront sins in other people's lives and let alone we cannot confront sins in our own personal lives. The question is, is there still zeal among believers? Where has the zeal of the Lord gone to in our lives as believers? Where has the zeal of the Lord gone to in believers' lives in the church? Where is the zeal of God? We become zealous for many other things, but the zeal of God seems to have evaded. The church seems to be evading the lives of believers. Make sure you do not lose the zeal of God. Because when you lose the zeal of God, you're going to lose any sense of righteousness. And that is the beginning of our fall and our walk away from God. Hallelujah. Oh Lord, we thank you. And let's look at, at, at the last one. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, we're going to read verse 11 and 12. Titus chapter 2, we're going to read verse 11 and 12. Ch Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. It reads as follows. For the grace of God has appeared. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to everyone. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to everyone. It instructs us. Remember grace. It is, what does grace do? It instructs us to renounce ungodliness. Grace instructs. You must be able to take instructions from grace. You do not only become saved by grace and not take its instruction. Grace instructs us. Grace teaches us. You must be teachable of grace. So it says, it instructs us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Let me read it again. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to everyone. It instructs us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives in the present age. But son, it's possible to live a godly right. It's possible to, to live a godly life. It's possible to live upright. It's, it's possible to live a sensible life in this present age because there is grace. I've written down here that believers must continue to live in the grace of God and be students to it. Believers must continue to live in the grace of God and be students to it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel the anointing of God. I feel the power of God right now. But let me, let me tell you, let me tell you. I don't know what people have told you. I don't know what people have told you about fornication. I don't know what people have told you about sexual immorality. I don't know what people have told you about, 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 about prostitution. I don't know what people have told you. I don't know what the law says regarding these things, except to say it's allowed by the law in the country. But, but yeah, Vazalan is the thing. Yeah, is the thing. The grace of God can teach you and me to say no. On our own, we cannot do it. On our own, we cannot do it. On our own, on our, on our own, we will not be able to say no. But it is grace because most of us, we, we profess that we've been saved by grace. I'm saying, indeed, I agree with you. We've been saved by grace. And the Bible says that this, this, this grace of God has appeared, has appeared and brings salvation to everyone. So, so this grace has appeared and has not left you. But, 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 but most of us are not humble enough to allow grace to teach us. We have received grace, but we have shut grace down. We, we have received grace, but we have silenced grace. Grace is crying out loud to, to, to say, allow me to speak to you. Allow me to teach you. You have silenced me enough. This is the last day you, you, I appeared in your life. I brought God's salvation in your life. Since that day, you received me, but you have silenced me from that day. I no longer talk to you. I no longer help you. I no longer teach you because you have silenced me. Most of us, that's what the Bible says. So, some people have trembled over the blood of Jesus. Most of us, we tremble over grace. We walk on grace because we, grace cannot teach us. We are silencing grace. We are oppressing the grace of God in our lives. That's why we are continuing to sin. That's why sinlessness knife it seems to be impossible. It seems to be impossible. Hallelujah. It seems to be impossible. 
It seems to be impossible, and I'm telling you now, as I'm about to pray now with you, I'm, I'm about to pray with you. Yes, grace. Grace is available. Grace did not come only to bring salvation, but grace came as our teacher. Grace came as an enabling power to say, hey, Tabo, you can live an upright life. You can live a sensible life. You can, you can, you can live a good life in this present age. This present age where wickedness is increasing and the love of men is growing cold as the Bible says so. So I'm saying there's grace today. There is grace. Let, let, let lose grace in your life and let grace start speaking in your life. Don't silence grace. Don't silence grace. Because when you silence grace, you have no other teacher. You have no other teacher. You have no other teacher because when you silence grace, this is the grace of God. And the Bible says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach us. He is the teacher. When you silence grace, you are silencing the Holy Spirit in your life. And they cannot be able to tell you to say, say not on godliness. They cannot be able to teach you because you have silenced them. There's grace for you. You are watching this, there's grace for you. You may be having one child. You may be having two children outside marriage. You, you possibly having three from different fathers. I don't know you, but I'm saying there's grace for you today. There's grace for you today. Only allow grace to teach you. And as grace teaches you, you must be able to be teachable. You must have a teachable spirit. You must have a teachable heart. And say, Holy Spirit, teach me. Spirit of grace, teach me. Teach me to say not on godliness. Teach me to live an upright life. Teach me to be godly in this present age. Teach me to be godly in this town. Teach me to be godly at my workplace. Teach me to be godly at church. Teach me to be godly. It's possible to live free from sexual immorality. It's possible to live free from fornication. It's possible to live free from prostitution. Here is grace. Grace makes it possible in your life. The question is, are you ready to receive the grace? Are you prepared to receive the grace? Are you willing to receive the grace and let grace start teaching you from today going forward? Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want to thank you because this is your word. You are allowing us to know the truth so that this truth that we know will set us free. I want to pray for everyone, Lord, that is receiving this message as a message that comes from you, as a prophetic message in someone's life, as a timely word in someone's life. I pray right now, Father, that as, as, as they receive this word, may also grace, Lord, begin to speak. May grace in their lives begin to teach them. And I pray that, Lord, as grace begins to teach them, as the Holy Spirit begins to teach them, let them, Lord, be good students to grace, be good students to the Holy Spirit. In the mighty glorious name of Jesus, I pray with thanksgiving and everyone say amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I, I thank you. I thank you for watching this video. And please don't forget that Jesus is coming back. He's ready. Whatever messages that we preach, let's not preach to excite people. Let's not preach to condemn people. But let's preach to get the bride ready for the coming of the groom. Because the wedding day is approaching even more closer. We should be ready. We should be preparing ourselves. And no time to play. No time to waste. We really, really have no time to waste. We must live for God. We must live for God. We must live uh, within the grace of God. And it's possible. Believe that it's possible and allow grace to begin teaching you in your life. God bless you. We love you and we continuously pray for you. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to like our Facebook page. In Jesus name. Amen.